Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open our hearts to the story of your love and open our minds to new ways of knowing you and open our doors to all that you would welcome here. Amen. So, here we are, and it's a brand new year. Lots of folks talk about clean slates and making new resolutions. And for me, even though our church calendar, our church new year, was a month ago at the beginning of Advent, I celebrate this calendar new year as well. It's probably because I get a fresh new calendar and a new planner and all of those new things that you can write in, all of these empty calendar dates with, that have so much possibility and they're just waiting to be filled in with graduations and anniversaries and birthdays and celebrations and vacations. I shouldn't have caught Caitlin's eye when I said graduation because now I feel like I want to cry. <laughs> because I think I've told you before, I'm one of those people who really like having something to look forward to. That feeling of anticipation, it keeps me going from one special event to the next. And I don't want it all planned out for me. I'm, I'm really, I don't like planning things out that far. But I do like to see that bird's eye view of all those moments um, ahead of me that are just ripe and full of expectation. That, and I really, really love office supplies. I know, it's strange but true. Gary's Toy Store is a, is a Lowe's or a Home Depot, but mine is Staples and Office Max. I love them. My sister always asks me for gift ideas at Christmas, and I'm like, it's the same as last year. You cannot go wrong if you just go down the school supply aisle at Target, I promise you. Things that are sure to make my heart smile are, you know, they're silly things. They're folders and journals and, and clipboards and pens and pencils and paper clips and Sharpies and all of that, and all the shapes and sizes and styles of post-it notes. I love post-it notes. They're one of my favorite office supplies. If you ever wander up to this lectern, you will find post-it notes all yeah. over the top of this. My desk at home has all sorts of, of post-it notes at eye level. My planner is full of them. I usually have one on, on my notes here. I carry them everywhere. I leave notes for everyone. My order of worship, has them scattered on there. I, I mark up my Bible with post-it notes. I use them as bookmarks. I love them. Did you know that they were discovered by accident? In 1968, there was a guy named Dr. Spencer Silver who worked at 3M. And he was actually a chemist, and he was trying to create a super strong adhesive. And he, he, he failed at that, and he wound up inventing a ridiculously weak one. And the guys at 3M didn't know what to do with this invention of his. They were not very impressed with this very weak adhesive that he had come up with. So it sat unused for about five years. And one of the things that they encouraged at 3M was for folks from other departments to visit other departments and kind of synergize each other and bounce ideas off each other and see what they're working on. So in 1973, one of Dr. Silver's colleagues, a man named Art Fry, you know, Spencer Silver, Art Fry, these are great names, right? Came to one of his seminars, and they got around to discussing this failed invention of his, and it was something that could only be used in very temporary applications, and nobody wanted anything to do with it. So Art either sang in his church choir, or he was a dedicated Methodist who followed John Wesley's rules for singing, and he committed to sing with um, his congregation as frequently as possible, which is... It's number three on page seven of the preface of your hymnals. It's great reading, actually, John Wesley's Rules for Singing. You should check it out sometime. Anyway, John Art was always dropping his hymnal and dropping bookmark, bookmarks out of his hymnal, marking his pages, and that drove him crazy. So he got this idea that this impermanent, non-damaging adhesive could be used on a bookmark that wouldn't fall out of his hymnal. It would take another seven years and a failed marketing attempt before post-it notes made a hit in 1980. And they only came in one size and one color, which is very, very sad. But today there are a, a trillion of them and they are stronger than ever. So this accidentally disco accidental discovery led to an innovation that helped folks with their hymnals and their homework assignments and orders of worship and notes on a bathroom mirror or a fridge or a front door. And animators even use them in storyboards, and writers use them to move chapters around because they're so easily movable up on a, on a wall. All because someone was looking for one thing 
and they were expecting to find that thing but they wound up discovering something else entirely, something better than they were originally looking for, something better than they imagined. And that discovery was an epiphany. An epiphany is something you hadn't seen before. It was unexpected. So on the liturgical or church calendar, today is known as the Feast of the Epiphany. It's the end of the 12 days of Christmas, and it's when the church celebrates the wise men who followed a star and had an epiphany. They found Jesus in Bethlehem. So our text today is from the Gospel of Matthew. It's the same text for this day every year. And it's Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And it starts off, In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. And I want to pause right here for a sec and point out something that's important. If you notice, our text doesn't say, it says that our, what the wise men came from the east, but it doesn't say how many there were. It doesn't tell us who they were. It doesn't even tell us exactly where they're from. It's all very vague. But it's often taken as biblical fact that there were three of them. And it just doesn't say that. Some stories even give us their names. But it doesn't say that either. And our nativity sets often depict their nationalities. But that is also not in the text. And we accept all these ideas as facts, but they're simply not there. So it's worth remembering this as we head into this new year, and we've been challenged to read the Bible for ourselves, to notice the times when what we think that we might know doesn't always line up with what's actually there. Because it's important for us to read God's word for ourselves, to learn what God does reveal to us, and to ask our own questions and be astonished by what we find, and to fall more deeply in love with a God that we can know, who does tell us about God and all of his wonders and magic and, and mystery. What we do read is that there are these wise men who come from the East and they're asking these questions about where to find the baby who's supposed to be born the king of the Jews. But they're not Jews themselves. They're most likely astrologers, and they're priests from another religion, which is why it's translated that they are wise, because they have all this knowledge about the stars. In those days, astrologers studied the night sky, and they charted the changes in their strange sightings, and when comets or supernovas would occur, they would say that a great leader was born. So this was actually superstition, which is magical, and that's where we get that word from, from the Greek word magoi, or magi. So these foreigners, these wise men, they aren't originally looking for a star to lead them to Jesus. The star just appears in the sky, skies that they knew like the back of their hands, and they said, whoa, what in the world is that? And they noted where it was, and as they studied, they discovered that a great leader of the Jewish nation was supposed to be born in that general area, so they head off to find him. And because they were priests, they brought gifts to worship him, even though they were a different religion. And they knew that Jerusalem was the big city for the Jewish people. This is where their temple was, this is where they held all their great festivals. So it made sense that this star would lead them to Jerusalem. But when they got there, they were confused because that's not actually where the star was. So they went to the king to find out if he knew where it would be. And our text continues in verse 3. And it says, When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for these wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, <coughs> saying, Go and search diligently for this child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay homage." Now, Herod was a powerful ruler. He was a powerful king, but he wasn't a great guy. He was actually a paranoid ruler. He had members of his own family killed because he thought that they might try to take his place. So when these astrologers come looking for a king, and they're not looking for him, 
Frightened was an understatement. He was probably in a frenzy. So he gathers the Jewish priests and the lawyers together and he grills them. He wants to know what they know about this great king who's supposed to rule the Jewish nation. And they tell him Micah's prophecies about the Messiah, their savior, who is to come from Bethlehem, about nine miles away on foot. So Herod calls the wise guys back in and he tells them what he's found out so that he can send them on this secret mission to thoroughly check out Bethlehem and report back so that he can go and worship this new king too. Wink, wink. He's asked them when they first saw this star so he can figure out how old the child might be. Because a few verses later after our text today, he's going to order all Hebrew boys under the age of two to be killed. He's a paranoid ruler and he's not a great guy. Continuing in verse 9, it says, When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. So these astrologers set out for Bethlehem. And they're, back on the, they're back on track, and they're following this star, and it leads them right to Jesus. They were likely traveling in a caravan, so several more than just three. It would have taken them a while to reach him, even on camel, which they probably did have, because they were not poor. It's possibly why they are called kings. They came with expensive gifts, three of them, which is why folks tend to say that there were three wise men. And we'll even, we've sung about it, we'll sing about it again. And their gifts have great significance. They've come to pay homage, to worship this king. And gold was typically a gift for royalty. But frankincense was a priestly spice. It was used for incense in rituals for worship. So they were also honoring him as a priest, his priestly lineage if not his divinity. And myrrh was a healing balm. So for someone who was a priest who was going to be healing folks and also for embalming, was used for embalming the dead. And scholars say that this gift foreshadowed Jesus's death because it was an unlikely gift for a king, but its healing properties would not have been an unusual gift for a priest. Our text tells us that the wise men are warned about Herod in a dream. So they don't go back to Jerusalem the way they came. They don't go back to Jerusalem to tell Herod that they did find Jesus. And they go home a different way. And angels in the Bible often come to folks in dreams throughout the Old and the New Testaments. Right after our text today, Joseph will be visited by an angel who tells him to take his wife and his child and escape to Egypt so that when Herod does go and order this edict to kill all the Hebrew children, Jesus would be safe. And they will stay there until an angel comes again to Joseph and tells him that Herod is dead and that it was safe to return home. And what's interesting to me about this story is that these foreigners, these folks who aren't the chosen people, they're not Jews, folks who don't know the history and the lineage and the promises and the prophecies, they're the ones who are looking for Jesus. They're the ones who are figuring out that this great king, this great priest has been born. And the ones who have memorized all those books of the Bible, the ones who have passed them down from generation to generation and could recite the words of God in their sleep and probably did, those are the ones who missed him. Even after the foreigners alerted them that something big might be going on in the place where they were expecting it to happen. These folks were expecting a king and they got a baby. And a poor one, born in the most unlikely and unsanitary of places to a teenager who wasn't even married when she got pregnant and married to a man who was not even the biological father? How many kings stepped down from their thrones to become the least of these? And each gospel has its own particular audience. Each was written for a certain people to tell a particular part of this amazing story. And Matthew's gospel was written for the Jews. It was to show them how all of the prophecies that they had been learning and reading, the ones that they knew best, that they actually were fulfilled by Jesus. But Matthew's gospel begins with these first folks figuring out who Jesus was, who are not even Jews. They're not even the chosen people. They're Gentiles. 
They're priests from another religion. They're kings from another culture. And yet right from the beginning, God is telling us how Jesus came for all of us. Matthew begins and ends his gospel this way, bringing foreigners into the story and then calling for us to go out and make disciples of all nations, bringing in even more foreigners and joining us all together into one nation. All because some astrologers watched the night sky, a sky that they knew by heart, and they came across something they weren't expecting, a star that came out of nowhere and wasn't where it was supposed to be. And they couldn't not follow that star and see where it led them and what it meant. And just like that, they had an epiphany. They saw something there that wasn't there before. They found the Messiah, and they knew that he was different, and that he was protected, and that he was royal, and that he was priestly, and he was divinely set apart. And we go about our days with expectations. And most of us get what we expect. Experts say that we will find what we are looking for. If we're Eeyore types of people, if you're familiar with Winnie the Pooh, Oh, bother. Nothing good is going to happen to me. We'll likely find dark clouds in spite of dazzling bright silver linings. And if we're these Tigger types of folks, you know, <laughs> everything's coming up roses. We'll likely find beautiful blooms, even if we have to search among a bunch of thorns. But what if we expected to find an epiphany around every corner? What if we expected to be an epiphany for someone else every single day? As Christians, we've just celebrated one of two of our most amazing miracles of our Christian faith, the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God sending his son to live and breathe and work and play and love and teach and just be with us. The light of the world come into the world. And we carry that Christ light inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we get to share it with the world around us, a world of darkness, folks who might not even be aware of it and who are definitely not expecting it. One of my favorite songs from the Walk to Emmaus retreat is called The Servant Song. And it has this verse and it says, I will hold the Christ light for you in the nighttime of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you. Speak the peace you long to hear. And a friend of mine recently was in a, hail, in a nail salon right before Christmas, and it was crazy busy. And I guess normally people aren't all on top of one another when they go to get their nails done. But with parties and get-togethers and everything around the Christmas season, this place was crazy, and there were, they, were, they were on top of each other. And my friend was sitting in the salon, and this woman came and sits down next to her, and they strike up conversation. And at some point during their conversation, this woman asks her, you know, what do you do? Where do you work? And my friend has to confess that she's a pastor, and sometimes that honestly changes the whole conversation. But the woman says, I knew there was a reason I sat down next to you. I've been away from the church for a very long time, but I have felt very close to God as I was sitting here with you. They weren't having a religious conversation. They were just spending time together in a nail salon, an unlikely place. A similar thing happened to me after Christmas. My hairstylist went out on maternity, on maternity leave early. She still hasn't given birth yet, I just wanna say. <laughs> but I had to find someone else to do all these fun colors in my hair. And it's not as easy as you might think because not everybody wants to do all these fun colors. It stains their hands. So I went somewhere else and I had someone new do my hair. And he was funny and he was smart and we talked the whole time that I was there. And he told me about his family and I told him about mine. And of course, at some point, he asked me what I did and where I worked and I had to confess to him that I was a pastor. And he didn't bat an eye. I'm grateful for that. When I got home, I got a text from him. And it said, thank you for being the hands and feet today. You touched my heart, you and Jesus. And I tell you that not because I think that I'm so great that, I, that this guy sent me this text. Because I'm not even sure that I know what I said or I did during that conversation to make him feel that way. I'm sure there are probably things in that man's life or in the woman that my friend encountered in the, in the nail salon that either of us could have looked for and picked apart if we were looking to find it. 
especially since both of these folks admitted they were definitely not churchy people. But we all have junk that could potentially disqualify us for sainthood. We're all a bunch of dirty dog sinners, you know, really. And we're all in need of a savior. That's why there's grace. I'm so grateful for grace because I am so the wretch the song refers to. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We get what we expect. I expect to find goodness and grace in folks. And I try my best, I do, to extend it when I can. Even those dump truck drivers, I know you guys are thinking that. I know you're thinking that. I try my best to extend it, especially outside of the church. Because it's easy to be a Christ light when you're surrounded by other Christ lights. But it's so much harder to be a Christ light when you're out in the darkness of the world. Let us hold that Christ light for all to see. Because the wise men found something different in the night sky that they knew so well. They found something they didn't expect, and they had to know what it was. It took them years to find it. They traveled great distances to find it. I pray that we would be so filled with Christ, with that Christ light, that others find something different in us, something that they don't expect, something that makes them want to know what it is. And I pray that it doesn't take them years, and I pray that they don't have to go to great distances to find it. Amen? Amen. And amen. Before we say the Apostles' Creed, I have something else that I just want to share with you. It's Epiphany Sunday, and the wise men have followed this star a great distance and a long time to find Jesus. And it's a tradition of mine to choose a word for the year to focus on to help me with my walk with Christ. And some folks will call this a star word for the for epiphany. So I have a basket of stars with different words on them today to give to you as you leave, for you to focus on this year. Sometimes the words that you choose or that choose you, they speak to you right away. And sometimes we get them and we think, God, you've got to be kidding. What is this word? What is this word that you want me to focus on this year? Because I have, there's a woman in another church that I have done this at and Every year, she comes back to me and asks for a new word, a new star. And the first word, first year that we did this, she loved her word. Oh, my gosh, she ate it up. She found it everywhere. It was in her Bible study. It was She heard it in, in um, sermons. She found it out with her friends, she, in books that she read. She just found it everywhere, and she loved that. She just was like, this was my word. But the second year, she got a word, and she was like, why did you give me this word? And I was like, you picked it. I don't know, you know. And uh, she hated it. And I don't think she actually made it the whole year before she finally gave up and said, give me another word. I don't want this one. And I tried to tell her, listen, it doesn't work the same way year after year. Embrace your word. You might still find it. Maybe God is trying to show you something. But she was, this was not, that was not, she was not having that at all. And that might happen to you. But I ask that you would try to keep yourself open to what God might be trying to show you or grow you with this word. Because I think it doesn't matter what words you pick, God can still show you something with, with any word that you choose. And I pray that it would mold you and form you and guide you like the stars that guided the wise men as you go through and you read your Bible this year and you seek to draw closer to Christ. Because it can be a wonderful way to draw closer to Christ. You, I, I usually choose a verse that goes with this word, and if you have trouble trying to come up with a verse, I can help you with that. But it's, it is like following the star to find Jesus. And I pray that your word would bless you.